Hello and welcome back inside the Part for May for podcast number 768. This is Todd. No, Todd, not now. A.K.A. Negative Camber. He's from Missouri, where they're all known to be killers of innocent men, women, and children. You know why I've asked you here. You must convince the villagers that I'm That's harmless. exactly what I need you to do tonight for your kind consideration. We're going to have some F1 news, but before doing that... Of course I have to introduce my co-host. You know what that means. I have to go all the way to the right coast of America, National our nation's capital, the swamp, where she plies her skills as a master statistician and the queen of cats. That's her. You know her. You love her. The lovely, the redoubtable. Grace! Grace, how you doing? I'm doing pretty good, Todd. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Doing well. Good, Hanging good. in there. Getting ready for Snowmageddon. Yeah, I think it's just going to be rain. Yay! Oh, you lucked out? I know. They aren't sure, but it's supposed to get almost into the 60s this week. Ooh. I'm pretty Wow. That's short weather. I'm (laughs) I'm over the snow. That's good. Nice. I mean, DC's had, again, I always contend, like, you know, we had, I mean, they still have snow in Western Pennsylvania, where I'm from originally, but it just snows. You have a consistent, you know, three months of snow. That's fine. Here in D.C., it's like one day it's 60, the next day it's 20, the next day it's 75. Like, I can't live that. Pick pick something. It's like a cat. Be in, be out. I don't care which it is. Just pick one. I'm not sitting at the door all day. Yeah, it's that way in Missouri, too. You know, it's like uh, Uh, we always get the January thaw, and then a few days late in January, it'd be like 70 degrees. Like, what? And, and then, then it'll snow happens. like hell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes it snows in April here. So, you know, it's yeah. uh, it's weird. But um... I, yeah, I worked in a professional, like a volunteer, you know, our, our professional group for, you know, survey nerds. And I, we tried to have a month, you know, a monthly meet and greet or a speaker or something every month to keep the, you know, membership active. And I was like, except in February. And people were like, why not February? I'm like, because it'll get canceled 700 times. Yeah. And I was right. Because February, always a bad idea. January yeah. is usually fine. February, always a mess. Yeah, 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 exactly. Don't it's, bother uh, February. It's a full assault. Well, Grace, we've got some Formula One news to cover this we week, do. and I thought this would be fun. And what better topic to to tantalize our listeners and viewers with than something that is right at the tip of everyone's uh, forethought on, and they're just really on the edge of their seat waiting to find out what will happen with these dosh Gosh darn, uh, a sprint race. I was trying to be nice. Um, I know. I was was like, should I say the the cuss words for you? (laughs) So uh, the sprint races. Yes, you know them. You love them, sprint races. Well, first off, I got to say that Christian Horner now has weighed in. So, you know, over the last two weeks, we have listened to Zach Brown wax poetic about every facet of F1, including sprint races, right? Uh, he's weighed in on, on, he sort of reminded me back. You remember a few years ago when, if there was any facet of formula one, including other teams, other teams, driver contracts, other teams, sponsorship contracts, anything you wanted to know, all you had to do is go ask total wolf Get down. Right. and he would comment, you know, he would just go on about, you know, red bull and their contract with max or whatever. Uh, but now I feel like Zach, you know, he's weighing in on what Lewis is going to do. He's, you know, he's got, he's really, uh, engaged. So we, shall we say, but Christian Horner. Uh, okay. said, look, you know, time is getting short on the plans and approval of possible budget increase to cover the expense of running six sprint races for 2022. So much so that Red Bull boss Christian Horner has said, quote, I'm very much a purist. I believe that qualifying and the race are the fundamental aspects of a Grand Prix. I think that the sprint races were very interesting last year. I think the format wasn't perfect, but if you don't try something, you don't know. And I think there are things that could be done to make it more exciting, to make it more interesting, but it's getting quite late now and we're going to need to have a decision pretty shortly, end quote. Now, having said all that, I got to say, Grace, I completely agree with that statement. Yeah, I like that that's like a not so hidden disdain. Like, this is a dumb idea, people. Let's already make a decision. Right. What are we waiting for? <laughs> yeah. Because um, I can't is... imagine the teams enjoy it. You know, this is just extra right. for them, you know? 
Well, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's just like, again, I think we've all been in that place where you're like, you're going to organize this conference. Oh, by the way, there's 30 people that you didn't know were coming are coming. Awesome. More yeah. work for me. Great. Yay. I love that. More wear Great and idea. tear. So, yeah, excellent. So this is fun. So yeah, the team so want this. And again, I think like we talked with Paul last week, there's no meat to it. There's no points behind it. They don't get anything. It's all lost, right? That's and what he's so, alluding to. He's saying, you know, hey, it was interesting. Yeah. I don't think the format's mm -hmm. really that the great, but... The laurel wreath is nice, but, you know, we're, right. we're moving on. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I, I think that's the nicest way one could phrase, this is a stupid idea, let's move on already. Yeah, I think it was a very polite way of saying, eh. What's going it's on? still the beginning of the season. Christian Horner is still very nice. <laughs> That's true. I mean, it's all relative, right? It's nice. like the Christian Horner right. scale of nice. But, you know, right. it's just maybe maybe it's because he's not being badgered by Ted, which is really where you get the good the good. That's where you Horner, get the good but, stuff, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. So, but yeah, he's right. clearly. I, but I, again, I don't want to. What are they waiting for? I don't know. Well, they've got to get together and vote on it, and they got to figure this out. And, and, you know, still, as I mentioned before, the issue for me is that if they haven't ironed out all of the details by now, they may want to pass on the issue and see if it's worth including in 2023. You have right. the cost of running, period. Just showing up to a track and running the car for a lap or two has its own exorbitant cost period right regardless of what you do and so if you're new to formula one and you see those things where they have oh you know martin bruno got to go drive the mclaren mp4 or david coulthard is going to run one of the older uh, red bulls that he used to race or one of those deals where they wheel the car out and they they usually go to silverstone because they're all kind of based there and so they'll go out of silverstone and they'll bring out an older car and they bring they have to bring a crew in the crew has to manage that car mm -hmm. it has to be started has to be ran a specific way the engine has to be treated a, a specific way they have to teach the driver if they've never driven it how to drive it not tear it up and it takes a lot of time and money just to run a car so a no different from formula one and it's the current tech so it's the most expensive so just running a car period which is immense that cost the cost of any wear and tear or potential damage to cover with the budget cap right right that was that budget cap was established pre sprint race concept and the entire notion of the format of the race and its efficacy in creating more entertainment, that's up to the eye of the beholder. But that's my concern with it. When you would you put everything in balance, you're thinking, OK, there are some teams that are wanting three plus million dollar increase to the budget cap to, accom to accommodate six sprint races. Now, Zach Brown thinks that's ridiculous. And the FIA, I think, gave him, what, half a million or 500,000 right. um, and Zach felt like it was stupid these teams three asking kidding. for three million right, right? right. Uh, so he very much doesn't want to increase the cost cap and nor do the smaller teams or the teams that have a little tighter budget right. so they don't want to increase that they want to keep those budgets low so they can That's manage the their operating costs right, right. exactly right and so if every time we're going to introduce something like i said what a week or two ago right they're, they're notorious for doing some sort of big cost cutting measure and then coming out with a regulation that completely blows it out of the water and i kind you of know, feel like that's this situation yeah it's kind of like um you're gonna buy a car but it's you're you think you're gonna pay the base model price nobody pays yeah, the base right. model price right? right you know so but the thing what i think is interesting is i don't know why it's taking so long because they they already raced the sprint races they have an idea you know it's not 2021 where we're still like hmm i wonder how much this will cost i wonder if people right. we know right you've already done a year's worth of sprint races so what is there to decide either but i just think you know testing probably st i don't actually know but testing starts Next in like month. two or three weeks there you yeah. go so all right four weeks testing starts you got to have these things right. worked out you can't just be like Oh, by the way, we're going to, you know, race 10 and we're going to have a sprint race. That's not how this works. Right. So I just think that oh, I don't know why they either have it or don't have it. I don't know what we're what we're dragging our heels about because we know how much it costs. Right. Because I think mm -hmm. like you were saying is that every time you roll a car out, there's some dollar amount. Right. Like yep. Every mile you run, 
the, the latest McLaren is X amount of money, right? Yep. You go back at the envelope, do that. They can do that with sprint races. They certainly know how much this costs. So yeah, I, they I can estimate the, the total of six races and the wear and tear right. and the fuel and right. everything it, it takes. What they can't factor in is damage. They could assume we're going to lose a front wing every race or whatever right. it might be. But this Depends gets back to drivers. the budget conversation. I don't want to get a, turn into too much of a business nerd here. But no doubt, look, we mentioned it, no doubt McLaren, Zach Brown, not a fan and not in favor of increasing the budget or at least slightly increasing right. it. But there is an issue that not all teams incur the same cost levels for production, maintenance, design, or fabrication of a car. Right. They may all be within a certain realm of expense, but not all are equal. And, the, and a team like Mercedes, Red Bull, Ferrari m would most likely have a much higher SG&A sales and general administrative costs or overhead than a team like Haas or even McLaren might, right? Right. And so because of that, it's it's one thing to say, well, Zach, Red Bull or Mercedes wants to increase at $3 million. Now, Zach may think, that's crazy because we have the budget cap for a reason. We're just blowing the budget cap. Look, you know, yeah, roll the dice. Right. We're going to run it. He doesn't want to increase or have to increase his budget or try to find $3 million more dollars for that program. Right? right. And um, and so it's difficult, but it may not cost Zach as much to fabricate a front wing. May. I don't know. It could cost more. Right. I don't know. But it may not cost those small teams as much to produce and fabricate and design the products that are going on those cars like Mercedes or Red Bull. You have to assume that the people that Mercedes have in place to do those particular things cost more per hour because they right. are maybe seasoned veterans and the best of the best or whatever it might be. Adrian right? Newey's going to cost you more than whoever Haas has, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. So that's an element that I think plays into this conversation about the budget cap increase. The, the program in itself, Grace, like any other feature in a product or a service that might be developed, there needs to be a more program uh, pr um, programmatic view of the sprint race feature with more detail and more, I would say, you kind of just mentioned it, actuarial calculations done yeah. to find the mean expense and the risk mitigation factor and other right. actual sprint race format creation as to how it impacts the championship, right? A team and right. the overall cost to compete um, all of that plays into it. Also, you have to factor a team's balance sheet, and each team has a different revenue stream, cost structure, and reason or way of doing business. They're similar because they're all race teams, but there are big differences between those teams, right? Right. And I think that's why, Grace, you mentioned it, and I think you're spot on. It needs a much more programmatic approach. Maybe they have one. Maybe we're just not hearing about it. They have to have one. I mean... I don't, I mean, I work on contracts, not the size of Formula One team, yeah. but you know, you don't just, I just don't go to, you know, my boss and say, oh, I need X amount of money. How are you going to spend it is always the first, you know, like you don't write a, there's no open-ended contracts, right? Like, so mm -hmm. this is all the things you have to look at. You always have to present, you know, right? Your risk mitigation. What happens if suddenly, you know, hospital is for all its front wings and you still have 12 more races to go. Right. Like, They've thought about these things and right. They absolutely have to look at the, the cost. I, I just think, especially since we've already done a year, this isn't, this is real. These are real numbers. This isn't just like, you know, I looked it up on Google, how much a sprint race might cost me. And I added some overhead to it. Right. Um, so I, I just think this is so, I don't, I don't know. Maybe we'll find out once a decision's made, what the, what the sticking point is. You know, like the, the FIA really wants them, but the teams hate it. I don't I don't know what the holdup is because I don't know why. The only reason, again, as we talked last week, I think this is only great if you're a fan in the stands on a race weekend. It's yeah. the only way this is good. Um, and since Formula One has not the teams necessarily, but, you know, the FIA or, uh, you know, Liberty Media, nobody ever seems to care about the fans. We just show up, right? Like, you know, uh, they patronize us all the time, right? We're there. We'll watch whatever Ferrari Cup Challenge, GP2, 
sprint race will watch it. So that's not the reason they're doing it. So I just think, that, yeah, what are we waiting here? Make a decision. Yep. I agree. Cause either way you're safe. You could say we try, we tried it. Hey, we're yeah, trying new things. Remember we, we talked it. about reverse grids. We talked about sprint races. We're trying new things. We're formula one. We're trying new things. That could be their new slogan, right? <laughs> that's fine. We're F1. Think, we try new things. I think we would all be okay with, Hey, we tried it. Hey, it didn't really work. We're not going to do it again. That's fine. You do that with the rules all the time, right? Like we tried these squiggly bits. They don't work. So we're going to ban those squiggly bits or whatever. Right. So it's okay. You can say that it didn't work. It was just experimental when you were trying it, but yeah, either whatever. do it or don't do it. I don't, I don't know what the holdup is. I don't know. I have no idea. It's so, just yeah, a... not good enough. Damn it. Not good enough. Cause anyway. nobody's come out and said, none of the teams have come out and said like, why aren't you know there there hasn't been a lot of talk i don't think from the teams about sprint races but nobody's been like you know gunther steiner isn't out there like i love sprint races why aren't we doing like i've heard nobody say it's all been like this lukewarm stuff like you know christian horner saying which is a no i hate it you know <laughs> right I, right you know if, if mom says maybe that's a no you know right <laughs> so right. Right. It, it isn't a ringing endorsement nobody has a ringing endorsement so i i don't know who who thinks it's a good idea yeah i don't know that there's anyone saying i don't care what they do in f1 but they they absolutely have right. to keep that sprint race because it was or awesome. I'm out. yeah i'm no, out i'm nobody, done with f1 yeah nobody has said that so no. i don't know yeah it's weird so, all right well we'll see what happens all right next topic <laughs> Shall we? They'll tell us in Bahrain. That's where they're going to they tell will. us everything. That's where they're going to tell us everything in Bahrain. They'll just unroll the scroll, right? Like, <laughs> Stefano Domenicali is just going to stand up there. Hear ye. <laughs> Let it be known that Sir Lewis Hamilton shall be returning is... for his championship bout. Right. Yeah. That's also, right. let it be known that the sprint race will continue with half a million dollars increase in budget cap. Yes, and we've added six more of them, right? Like, right. What? <laughs> what are we just? I think that's it. Everything is just wait till Bahrain. Right. This is like, this is the worst. It's like somehow Christmas I see Day him. Something. Somehow I see him jacking up the cost, the budget by like three million dollars, and all of a sudden Zach Brown becomes the Martin Luther, nailing those ninety-five theses that's... to the to the F one door, you know, and uh, leading a revolution. There you go, Zach. Which. I, as an aside, uh, the ninety, the ninety-nine theses could have been a lot shorter. I think Martin Luther could have said like three things. Maybe. I, <laughs> I, I guess now I'm telling myself. I grew up Lutheran. There's a lot of repetition in there. <laughs> Editor, man, like cut it down. We get yeah. it. You hate the Catholics. You didn't need all this. Yeah, he's a verbose guy. <laughs> you know? I guess he I wanted guess to make so, sure but... you truly got it. You know, Romans eight twenty-eight. Read it. <laughs> like if I was sleeping during catechism class, I don't know. I just right. think that like, right. man, that guy could have used an editor. There's a lot there. <laughs> uh, we had yeah. a lot on his mind, apparently. The so. more you know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> what does it all like, mean, Basil? <laughs> what are they talking about? Uh, imputed righteousness. What? Uh, so anyway, let's talk about a condensed weekend, shall we? At yeah. one end of the spectrum, we're talking about 23 races, possibly. That is on the counter, 23. Whether right. they get them all off, I don't know. But 23 races, six sprint races. And by the way, because there are 23 races scheduled for 2022, the grind will be enormous for the teams and personnel, and F1 is going to condense the weekends. And this just seems to me to be flying completely under the radar. And and I think it'll come to the weekend and everybody's going to be like, Hey, what happened? Yeah. People so, are going to show up on Thursday and just right. be like, well, wait a minute, Where's my the mic? team boss Where is everybody? Yeah. Right? What's good? Right. So traditionally, um, it has been a four-day Grand Prix weekend on Grand Prix weekends. With the media day on Thursday, that's where they do all the driver interviews and the, the team boss interviews, et cetera, et cetera. And then that's followed by the free practice on Friday, the qualifying on Saturday, and the race on Sunday. Now, Thursday has been completely scrapped altogether with the media time moved to Friday morning 
ahead of the practice session. And now get this, if that wasn't a dramatic enough ship, and by the way, I'm not disagreeing with it because doing this is going to really save right. some wear and tear on the team members, sure. mechanics, and everybody mm -hmm. that works with the teams. So I, I'm for it. But this is how major this is. For time immemorial, the Monaco Grand Prix has had the media days and, and all of that has been done on Wednesday, Thursday, but Friday has always been, remember, quiet day. Quiet day. Right? Yes. So Fridays in Monaco is, right? Not anymore. Mm -hmm. With this condensed weekend, even Monaco, which is mandated Friday is a quiet day, that Friday now is going, it's going to be Friday through Sunday affair, which is completely different. That, that right, right. completely different. That's, mm -hmm. You know, my mind is still trying to work around that because my entire life, it's, you know, that I can recall, it's been been like that. Yeah. And yeah. then the media time for the team principals, that's not going to happen on Friday mornings. That's getting moved to Saturday mornings ahead of qualifying. Oh, all Which the more is fun. probably okay because you could see how they do in practice and then grill them right before qualifying. Right, I think and, that gives us more material, right? Yeah, maybe a little, it gives journalists a little more material and say, you know, Gunther, you kind of sucked it out there on Friday. How you feeling today, right? Right, right, how's it yeah. going? How are you feeling about your weekend? Right. So, uh, so uh, okay, so my first question is, those are 23 scheduled races, but mm. sometimes there's asterisks, right? Because they haven't signed a deal or, but those are literally, there aren't any asterisks, right? Just Miami? Maybe? Yeah, it was Austin asterisk? I, I think so, because they, aren't they having to sign a deal? I thought their contract was up at yeah. uh, the end of last year. I was just trying to think of why. I mean, as opposed to COVID, right? So yes. one of the reasons why maybe we won't have 23 races is COVID. The other reason Good. is because somebody hasn't signed a deal or, you know, they didn't build a track or whatever. And so then uh, there isn't actually a race in that city. And I think there are fewer of those because sometimes we have like three or four that are like, maybe they'll happen, maybe they won't. Um, they all seem to be races that will happen. Um, so short of a pandemic reason for not happening, we'll have a 23 race calendar. So I think it makes absolute sense. I think just the logistics of trying to get all the equipment from one place to another, um, it, right. is enormous. Yeah, and then you're right. Is. There's the human, the human toll when you have yeah, yeah. multiple three races in a row, it's yeah. The human toll and, and, and for what, and I also don't know how much, I think like everybody and everything we've learned through the pandemic, if nothing else, what you can give up. You know, like we all thought, well, you needed four days. Well, clearly right. they've scaled back in different places and they've said, oh, maybe we really don't need four days. Maybe we can live with just three days. And so I think that's part of it too, is that we've had this experience of like, we can't do these things. Did we need them? We re Everybody rethinks everything. And so Formula One's no different. And if they can make everybody's lives better, easier, happier, by dropping a day that they can fit in elsewhere, then why not? And again, I'm with you. I think putting the team principals after practice, all the better. Let's make them sit next to each other. Like the, you know, I mean, they already do that sometimes like, oh, they're going to make Toto and Christian Horner sit together, right? Like now you could really set it up in a way that it's like, oh, these two, huh? let's see what we got. Somebody's going to run into somebody and then they'll be in a meeting together. I agree. I agree. That makes it more fun. So I, I'm fine with that. Yeah. I, I think. Humans okay. need time. They do. Know. All right. Let's move on, shall we? Uh, what What do we do with a pink slip Massey? What do we do with a broken Massey? I don't know. Oh. Uh, can we talk about Michael Massey a little bit? Of course, sure. Can we? Yeah. I don't know. Okay. Um, oh. Michael Massey, boy, uh, uh, the world's favorite punching <laughs> bag at this point. Again, I think I think much like thanks Obama became a hashtag uh, 
thanks thanks michael massey or you know anytime we're you know flip and i'll be watching a wizards game and there'll be a bad efficient call we blame michael massey you know i think <laughs> i think he really is again like chris bangle like i said last week like i think michael massey just gets blamed oh i dropped my ice cream cone damn it michael massey like i right. just blame that guy for everything right like right. we are now at a point where everything is michael massey's fault uh michael massey ah! um Okay, so the new sort of overseer for the FIA of Formula One uh, is a guy named Peter Bear. Okay. He's been with the FIA for quite a while, but now he's yeah. in this new role where he's been appointed as the FIA's head of F1, if you will. He said this, are you ready? Quote, Michael did a super job in many ways. We told him that. <laughs> but... <laughs> That's terrible. They literally did that. They literally yeah. gave him two nice things and then a terrible thing. Yeah. No textbook. Right. So he says, Michael did a super job in many ways. We told him that. But also that there is a possibility there could be a new race director. <laughs> are they going to fire him over text message? What are they doing there? He continues, oh, Grace. We are looking at dividing the various tasks of the race director, who is also the sports director, safety, and track delegate. That was simply too much. These roles are divided between several people. This reduces the burden on the race director. Um, and this is, uh, he said that, they're also looking at the safety car rules. And while like NASCAR's right. green, white checker works, he brought up a good point that it may pose a real problem with fuel loads in F1. And that's something that they're looking at. And you can say, well, just tell them to carry more fuel. You could, but you don't know how many laps extra it would take because you Does don't know how work? many laps it would be behind safety car. Does it work in NASCAR? I think we've all just accepted it. I think I th it, I all, just, all my NASCAR friends who love NASCAR say it works perfectly. Okay. I'm just saying that I uh, think when they first started doing this, I don't think everybody was like, oh. No, people checker. didn't. You're, you're I, I was savior. watching Where have NASCAR. you been? Yeah. I was, no. you, you and I both were right. watching NASCAR back then. And when it kind of came out, we were like, eh. Mm. I so know. I think, and, and NASCAR of all things is often, it's, it's what we're afraid of, I think, is that. I mean, the drivers just say it. Oh, it's all about entertainment. Right. You know, right? Like, of course. Competition caution. I should be entertained by it, but I want it to be a sport and not WWE, right? And I think NASCAR is fully embraced. Oh, we're yes. the WWE. It's fine. Yeah. So right. I just question this idea of like, oh, the green white checker works because people did not think it worked when it first came out. And maybe we're all just like 20 years later, we're just so used to it. We don't even question it anymore. Yeah. I still can't even get my head around the whole NASCAR playoff thing. I don't even know what's going on there. The race. I was told I there would be no math. Is. You know, I don't know. Anyway, I don't even know anymore. I don't, I don't even know. I don't know. I don't know. So anyway, uh, but it is a good point because Formula One cars, yeah. you know, weight is the enemy. You don't need to carry an ounce more fuel than you need to. Um, you can say, oh, just fill them up more fuel. You be okay. So they put, uh, you know, a little bit more fuel in it just in case. But if the, if they go behind the safety car for 10 laps, all of a sudden you're back into fuel issue. And then do you make everybody stop to top off? Well, then you can't do that because, you know, they're already locked. You know, it's, uh, yeah, this is a whole thing. You know, you see in Formula One how issues beget issues, right? Oh, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Um, so anyway, he's looking at this. Now, he did make this. I thought this was interesting, and I wanted to share this with you folks. Um, he Bayer made an interesting comment about the Mercedes appeal and if they had not dropped the appeal, okay? So mm -hmm. Mercedes weren't happy with the judgment of the stewards at the end of the race. They had an sure. opportunity to appeal. They alluded that they were definitely going to appeal, and then they backed mm -hmm. off of it, right? And I'm right. assuming that the journalists asked him about this and said, well, you know, maybe they should have appealed. And here's what he said about that. And I thought this was interesting. Would love your okay. opinion on it out there. Um, he said, quote, had the Mercedes protest gone to the Court of Appeal after being rejected by the stewards, what would have happened? 
I think the judges would have said it's different in the regulations. He decided that way so we could just void the result. But even then, if it were canceled, Max Verstappen would have still been the world champion because he was right. ahead going into the race. The situation was far from perfect, and that's why we're working on it. It's also about having respect for the race director. My job is to look ahead. How can we improve things? End quote. Interesting Which, point in that, Grace. Mm -hmm. They could have just said, okay, there's two sides. Team bosses are yelling at Michael. He's trying to appease both, trying to figure out. Then all the teams were yelling at him not to finish under a right. safety car. Blah, blah, blah. He made the best ju judgment he could in the span of just seconds. Moments, right. Moments. And it came out that way. So we'll just discount the result of that final race. Okay, that's not going to – I think you have to stick with – it happens in all sports, right, that – a bad call was made. I, you know, yep. Philip and I talk about how I think spa is actually a worse call, but we don't talk about spa because it happened in August and it wasn't the last race down to the last point for a championship, but it's not as if there aren't other places where we could all point to, well, that's a problem and that's a problem and that's a problem, right? It's just, that's going to be the most glaring one because that's the one we all see and we're all watching yeah, right. and it decided a championship. So I think it's always good to do a post-mortem. I, I would assume that they do that every every year. You you would always want to improve your officiating. Um, and, you know, look at what, is the race director's job the right, the right, you know, balance? Does he need more people? Does he need more things? So I don't have a problem. I, I think that makes total sense. And I think that no matter what size you're on with that last lap decision, we can all agree that something needs to be done, right? Yeah, right. Um, Oh, I think I you're didn't... right. It's always important to read the epitaph, you know, and figure yeah, out right. what was what was the cause, what happened. You mm -hmm. always do, a, you know, again, I'm going back to contracts. At the end of a contract, you always do closeout. Part of your closeout is always what worked, what didn't work, what could we do better right. next time, right? right? What have we learned from this experience? What can I share with other people so they don't make the same mistakes I do? Right. That's just a part of any operation. And so, um, and of course, it makes sense that they're going to look at other motorsports. You know, what do they do in other FIAs? You know, sanctioned sports. What yep. do they do in other? You know, what do they do in MotoGP? What do they do in NASCAR? WC, you want to gather, as, yep. yeah, gather as much information as you can before you make those decisions. And again, I I think I stand. I agree that he needs there needs to be more people. Charlie Whiting had more people. Michael Massey doesn't have that kind of support, and that's problematic. So everyone needs a Herbie Blash. They do. They do. So I need um, a Herbie Blash. You know, I agree. I do, too. But I just Herbie think... needs a Herbie Blash. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, yeah, I just think that it, it, to me, this makes sense. And, I, you know, the other thing I think is that everybody's going to have to get on point come Bahrain because this is going to be every journalist question. So just prepare now. Just prepare, especially Mercedes, Red Bull, you know. That's we've discussed it. We discussed it with the FIA. That's in the past. We're looking for it. It's it's generic football coach speak, right? That was the first half. We're now into the second half. We're not talking about that anymore. I told my guys they got to do this thing. Everybody, just come up with your talking point now, and just if everybody says the same thing, we can get past this. It's just because it it's it's dead time, right? It's the it's the yeah. off season. What else do we have to to grind on here? So except for Michael Massey, but I right. also think it's. I also think it's one place, I, I think this goes without saying, but I'm going to say it. it's one place to say, oh, Formula One, I think you should do this, or I think this would work better. It is another to to uh, attack people or to make it personal or to make physical threats against people. Yeah, that's uncalled for. That is unnecessary. Yeah, unnecessary. I agree. You can Especially... be unhappy and not go that far. That's right. Especially knowing that Michael, as well as you, me, everyone needs a Herbie. I mean... Yeah, you know, he's it's not like that commercial from the eighties, Grace, my Herbie, my Herbie, my Herbie and me, we like to climb up a tree. My Herbie and me were the best friends it can be. Come on. Nobody nobody is he's not trying to do a bad job. I guess is where no, I go. No, he wasn't. None of us no. are, right? Like I have made mistakes in my professional career and you go, and that was stupid. And then you have to try to fix it and resolve it. But you he's not trying to to make a mockery of it. So and I don't right. think that there's somebody else that can do his job. I think that is another big component that there isn't. I I don't I don't see anybody talking about that. There's been a hierarchy behind him, or there he's bringing people up behind him. So 
you can move Michael Massey. You can change what all is under his purview, but I don't think you can fire him even if they wanted to. Because who's going to be your new Michael Massey, you know, six weeks from your first race? I don't know. That seems like a bad idea. Who is going to be the new Michael Massey? You know, I ran an informal little poll on Twitter. Okay. And from our, our Twitter account, and completely informal here. Um, and I just said, do you think Michael Massey will be the race director in 2022? It was about split. I was going to say, when I answered mm -hmm. it, it was 50-50. I yeah. thought it was pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I only ran it for a couple of days. But it's still, in that limited amount of time, it was about 50-50. I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, so I did, too. All anyway, right. It's kind of like Angela. Everybody needs a Herbie Blash. Everybody needs an Angela. That's all, right. Our lives would all be better. Yeah, yeah. All right, let's move on. Uh, hey, in big news, uh, the Singapore Grand Prix. The Singapore Grand Prix hasn't been on the calendar for the last two years. So if you are a recent convert from the uh, uh, Drive to Survive from Netflix in the last 24 months, you haven't had the uh, pleasure of seeing the Singapore Grand Prix. And for you veterans out there, you will know that it was the first night race in Formula One. It came on the calendar in 2008, and Felipe Massa dragged a fuel rig all the way down the pit lane, and uh, Fernando Alonso had crash gate and purposely crashed, had his teammate uh, uh, crash, and uh junior uh crash and that prompted uh crash gate that was the end of renault and uh flavio briatori who was uh ushered completely out of the uh out of the sport right, Jesus yeah. Christ. right? so That's um right. that all happened in 2008 uh but they've just inked a new deal uh, because they haven't been on the calendar for the last two years over covid right. but they just inked a new deal to remain on the calendar to 2028 and you will be happy to know, Grace, that race promoters have also said that they are using the opportunity to be more sustainable, including, quote, switching to renewable energy sources and, quote, increasing recycling efforts. So they're going to oh. pay Sebastian to clean the grandstands, apparently. I just think we need, what are we doing to make this more sustainable? I guess that's just going to be, it's going to yeah. be the thing now. All right. We're going to pay Seb to clean up. That'd be awesome. I'd like to hang out with Seb. I'm going to have to hire those school kids though. They had some really rough questions for him. I don't think I could be that uh, poignant right. in my question asking. I think I'd mostly just be like, hey, you're Sebastian Vettel. <laughs> <laughs> like, hey. Do you go really fast? Oh my God, you're great. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Hey, don't don't blame me. I asked him how fast he was at changing diapers when I had the opportunity to See? interview him. That's, yeah, that's what you question. do when that's you're right. when you're the part for me. That's the kind of stuff we want to know. You know, Cut, cutting edge journalism. This is yeah. why they got rid of Thursday. <laughs> these right. kind of questions. The reason but, I um, asked him because he's a father of two daughters. Right. I'm a father of two daughters. And I know everyone, a million people gotten in that car already. Oh, well, you're really fast. And what do you think of Formula One? And, uh, and I thought, you know what? The hell with all that stuff. I'm going to ask him something personal. Yeah. How fast are you just, changing diapers? He goes, I was just oh, using. Average. I, think, <laughs> I said, average. can you do it with one hand? He goes, oh, no. Aha, I got him. I could do <laughs> it with one go. hand. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think. I think it's a whole different world if it's a boy involved. That's a whole different diaper changing. That is a it... different experience. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes, because then it then it becomes then you have to have that washcloth ready. Yeah, and it's, it's a projectile. Like... Yes. Yeah, right. Because <laughs> it's yeah. like uh, Indiana Jones, right? The sec the second that diaper comes off, that right. washcloth better be ready. <laughs> That's right. That's right. It's when he takes the idol in the sandbag. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. You have to be prepared because the yeah, second yeah, you yeah. are, you're getting pee in your mouth, and nobody wants yep. that. So. Well, no, nobody. Well. <laughs> oh. Yes. I'm going to keep this family friendly and me go too. From, me too. I'm not from going your child. there. <laughs> I'm not going that. there. Just saying. Uh, okay. So anyway, sing whatever, back whatever on. people want to do. So whatever, I think, let's get out of that. Shall I, we? It was fine. I so I, I was just giving you a hard time about your question. Okay. I think that's, that All was right. totally fun. I have a kind of a, a interesting story I wanted to share. All right. Many years ago, I was born and raised in Kansas city, Missouri. Yeah. And then I moved to St. Louis where I live now. I don't want to talk about it, Grace. I just don't want to talk about it. 
Because when you've been a Kansas City Chiefs fan your whole life, you have learned to live I... with disappointment. All right? And All right. this is just what happens when you're a Chiefs fan. It just happens. Okay? I'm just Angles. saying it. I'm All not right, okay no. with that. That's not the story I wanted to say. Um, okay. I mean, we're, we're here. We're, it is your... <laughs> You're half of this podcast. You do all the heavy lifting. If you want to, you know, use a little th free therapy time, uh, I, I I totally understand. I live in D.C. Our sports teams are terrible. So. No, no. I was just saying the Chiefs lost, right. and uh, that's what I'm going to say, and I'm not taking questions this time. Thank you. Um, so. <laughs> all right. Fair anyway. Enough. Uh, okay. F1 is life relevant. You've often heard us call it road relevant. Well, we often talk about how Formula One is road relevant with technology innovation. And this is uh, a little lengthy, but bear with me. I think you guys will find it slightly uh, uh, interesting or occasionally insightful. Uh, but we often talk about it being road relevant with technology innovation, but many F1 pundits have used F1 as a role model of technology innovation tied to other walks of life, such as like, business coaching, and I'm looking at you, Derek Daly, uh, motivational speaking, and I'm looking at you, Derek Daly, um, higher education, and much more. Uh, there's nothing wrong with any of that, because you can learn something about how F1 teams work, or in some cases don't work, right? One voice that has been continual in the sport about using F1's genius to solve problems is that of Sir Jackie Stewart. Now, I know if you're uh, a younger F1 fan and you see this, you know, guy puttering around the paddock in tartan pants and a hat and everything, oh, who the hell is that old guy? That old guy is the uh, world champion Jackie Stewart, and he was freaking awesome, all right? And he has always been a stalwart in the fight to improve safety in motorsport. And if you're newer to the sport, you can directly draw many of the safety measures in Formula One to Jackie and his peers of that era, which really pressured Formula One to raise its game on safety. And Jackie was really at the forefront of that, uh, along with a couple other people. Um, so he has fought for safety a long time. You remember a few podcasts ago, I mentioned he felt that as the drivers got younger and younger, the professional, the money, the fame, all that becomes uh, uh, really onerous to these young men or women, whoever. And he was saying that he felt it was important to have an outside sports psychologist or coach to help them, right? And he's been advocating that for the last five years. Well, it just so happens that he's now focused on bringing F1's innovation off the track and into the medical industry. Sadly, Jackie's wife, Helen, who has been at his side for decades, uh, has been suffering from dementia. And anyone who's had a family member who has suffered from dementia knows how difficult that really is for everyone involved, mm -hmm. and mainly the person suffering from dementia. Uh, and so she's been suffering with dementia for quite a while now. And he knows this firsthand how devastating this can be. Uh, Hat Tep Autosport uh, had this story. Uh, so the Sir Jackie Stewart Classic uh, presented by Rolex, who is his sponsor, uh, is due to be held on the 18th and 19th of June this year in the Scottish Borders, an event that is set to feature memorabilia from the Scots' successful career, including helmets, cars, trophies. Uh, there is also going to be uh, a, a sprint along the castle's driveway organized by the Scottish Motor Racing Club um, and a classic car show from the Borders Vintage Automobile Club. Uh, all the money raised from the event will go to Race Against Dementia, and Stewart believes that the world of motorsports can significantly help in pushing for the cure. And here's the quote that he said. Uh, it's been going on for years now without a cure or without preventative medicine, and that for me is unacceptable. If that was the world of motorsport, they would find a solution. There's no cure at the present time, and my logic is using Formula One in motorsport. We're bringing all our, all our young PhD students into Red Bull and into McLaren to let them see how fast problem solving is achieved. The same culture is in Formula One. We want it with dementia. The elder generation have failed. They don't want to hear that, but they've failed. They don't have a cure, and it's an illness that they're saying for everyone born today, one in three are going to have dementia. And I thought, you know, there's a guy who's very passionate about this. It's very personal to him. 
And, you know, I think also, Grace, it's one of those things when we talk about cures, um, I know the medical industry is all on top of this, but, it, you know, for us lay people who aren't in that industry, you know, I think the pandemic has taught us, you know, there's one thing in trying to come up with vaccine, vaccine, but, you know, there's certainly a big discussion about therapeutics and, and, and trying mm -hmm. to just maintain, right, um, and just preventative me uh, uh, medicine. Um, and so not a lot has happened on that front. One thing that is very present in F1 methodology is rapid prototyping and problem mm -hmm. solving. Because every race weekend you participate with a performance disadvantage in your car means more and more and more points you're going to lose. And the team have to make very rapid changes and advancement quickly. And I think what Jackie is saying is that the medical community could use some of F1's innovation in helping more than just road cars, but actually helping the uh, medical community in the way that they approach problem solving and the methodology at, at, at the way they work. And my gosh, one goes no further than to see what Mercedes has done in the last seven or eight years to see how efficient they've been. So I just thought this is a great story, a human interest story. I thought it was great cause. Um, and uh, kind of a cool use of F1 of uh, getting into a different field. Yeah, absolutely. I think that and anything you can do to call attention to something like dementia, something that we know very little about, right? Mm -hmm. There's nothing, um, we don't know why some people get it and other people don't. And I agree with you. You know, I've had uh, women in my family who've had dementia. And it's, it is terrible. It, yeah. It's hard, right? So, yep. and and to be your wife, right? To be the person that you yeah. care for every day in this situation. And I just think that um, you have to call attention because medicine is always going to follow the money. And so right. if there isn't money in dementia, then that's you're not going to see development there for uh, cures and therapeutics. And um, yeah, so I, I, I'm, I'm all for it. I think that uh, Jackie Stewart bringing attention to it as always matters because I think that yeah. he's one of those people that, especially in the United States, I think a lot of people in the United States are familiar with Jackie Stewart just because of his other, um, you know, post racing endeavors. Yeah, right. But I think that he's somebody that people go, oh, Jackie Stewart, I've heard that name, or you know, it's like Mario Andretti, right? It's kind of yeah. something that that people kind of know who Jackie Stewart is, even if they don't kind of know who Jackie Stewart is. And so, anytime somebody can use their platform. Um, to help a cause uh, like dementia, I mean, how, how could you not be behind that? And, you know, if, if they can push people to pay more attention to diseases that um, don't get the attention they deserve, I, you know, it's, it's hard to argue against that. I agree. Everybody knows who Jackie is. This looks like a bit of a heavy monster. It's a great car. Aerodynamics come in at any speed. Positive directional stability. All in all, the car is very good on the road. Ford, I think, have done such a good job on the temple. Yep. That's right. So, uh, yeah, so right on. I think this is a great story. I think that, um, you know, what, whatever we can do to support uh, Jackie Stewart and, and Brace okay. Against Dementia, why wouldn't we? Fair enough. That's it, Grace. We've made it to Albon's Cats. Yes, this is when we start talking about stuff that doesn't really make sense. But, you know. Whatever. We do it anyway. We do it anyway, you know? That's right. We don't let that stop us. No, of course not. Of course Shenanigans. Not. No. Again, if you just started to listen to the podcast, Grace and I talked about how we're always envious of those Formula One fans that say, well, you remember what happened in 2006 at the, uh, at the Australian Grand Prix on lap 72. Yeah. No. Not me. I don't. And yet there are people that... I, don't remember any of that stuff, which we should. That's what we should be remembering. But we don't. But for some strange reason, Grace knows the names of all of Alex Alvon's cats. That's the yeah. weird thing about Formula One. You can get think, anchored into multiple levels of Formula One and enjoy it because of that. But I think that's true in my entire life. So it's not just Formula <laughs> right. One. I am I right. am not I am not the person that somebody will go. Back in, you know, 2017, what question do we have on X? I don't know. Let me go pull the questionnaire. Like, I don't have yeah. that. Uh, I don't have that memory at all uh, for those kind of like, I don't know. Flip has that. He could tell me everything about, you yeah. know, the 1978 Steelers. And I'm like, well, oh, I don't know. Franco Harris. Good. Yeah. 
That's, that's right. When so I I'm played like, football and I was a running back, it was 32. I wanted to be Franco Harris. Everybody, uh, you know. Everybody wanted to be Franco. Why wouldn't you want to be Franco Harris? Oh. But I'm just saying, like, he has this kind of, like, knowledge, and I don't have that. And so um, Albon's cats is often my defense. Well, I don't know, right. Albon's cats. Why do, you, why do you ask me these things? Right. Although – I do remember certain things like uh, recently we watched, uh, oh, I'm plugging somebody else, but a WTF1 did a bit on uh, the Fernando Alonso uh, m- uh, McLaren debacle, the just the wind uh-huh. uh, debacle, and what actually happened to Alonso. And I was like, I don't remember this. Oh, I remember this. Like, I didn't Hashtag remember the just the wind. I didn't remember the date at all. But once he started getting into the story, I was like, oh, yeah. And then I could, I totally then was able yeah. to recount the entire event. And because yes. uh, that was pre-flips watching Formula One, but I was like, I didn't know the date. <laughs> but you remember so, the event. Of course, because that was a big thing. And we, we joked, we still joke about it. I have a mug I, that says just the yeah. wind is a hashtag on it, right? So There are things I remember. I remember when David Coulthard tried to kill Michael Schumacher at Spa 98. <laughs> Nobody will forget Spa 98. <laughs> You know, that. that's gonna be one of those things where people are gonna be like, I don't know what happened at Spa ninety eight, but Todd's really mad about it. Yeah, I'm still <laughs> mad about Spa ninety eight. Oh, boy. Right. Anyway, but in Albin's Cats, I started my own uh a thing called Todd's No Shit Headlines, where I just pick out random headlines for, from the past week in Formula One News, and I let the headlines stand on their own. All right, with a little commentary right and left, but it is funny because the art of journalism uh, has died, and uh, it's fun to read these headlines. Um, and it's why I tend to always gravitate towards the veteran Formula One journalists. Uh, Wait, can I interrupt know- you before you? Oh, sorry. Well, they still know AP to- style, and they still know how to write a headline. <laughs> I just didn't want you to go to your first headline before I shared. I, I told you I had no stories. Lies. Total lies. Oh. I do have a story. Okay. So I, I was watching, again, there was some bit where Jensen Button and Alex Albaum were racing carts in L.A. Uh-huh. And Jensen Button's like, oh, I live in L.A. I live not that far from here. And I'm like, why don't I live in L.A.? I could totally be Jensen Button's neighbor. As long as he never comes into my office, he'll never know. He'll never know. I just, oh, that guy, he looks nice. We should be friends with him. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah, didn't feel Button not? lived in la we need to find we need to find him la it's a small city we'll totally track him down but yeah i was just like oh what am i doing here we could be over there and i could be you know quietly stalking jensen button and again as long as he never comes into my office he'll never be none the wiser and you say he's he was out there racing carts in la yeah, you know, they were doing, like, him and Alex Albon were just doing, like, a fun promo kind of like, this is my buddy, Alex Albon, you know, like ah. they do. Yeah. That's oh, L.A. You will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy. What are you, what are you? L.A. is not that bad. What are you doing, Jensen? I don't know. I just hey, thought, you know, I didn't know. Hey, you know who else was in L.A. this past week getting a nice coffee? Lewis <laughs> Hamilton. <laughs> there you go. See it all tied in, and I didn't even know it would. Didn't even know maybe it tied he, in. Maybe he's hanging out with Button. He could maybe have been hanging a nice out with Button. Together. Saying, "Hey, you won that championship, no right? Quit? Would you? Know, you glad yeah. you quit? Because you know I'm thinking about. It. I don't know. What so do anyway, think, anyway, these are my uh, Todd's no shit headlines. So here we go. Are you we ready for these? Uh, I'm ready now. I'm ready. All right, number one. F1 legend David Coulthard dating Swedish model 23 years his junior after ending nine-year marriage to TV star wife. Uh, okay. Did you get all that? I don't know why I care, but okay. A little age-shaming David, aren't you? Yeah, I understand. That's he could be that She could be his daughter. I get it. I know what you're saying. Yeah, I, I get that. But and I his nine-year being... marriage to poor TV star wife. TV star wife. Who doesn't have a name, I guess. No, apparently. Yeah. Could have just called her Mrs. Know. Coultard. You know, what do you know? She doesn't All have right. to take his name. I just think, she whatever. Doesn't. Date who you want. You know, do do whatever. Whatever. DC, I don't care, you David do Coulthard. you, DC. Whatever. whatever. You're All right, a next man. up. Lewis Hamilton spotted for the first time ahead of 2021-2022 F1 season as Mercedes driver grabs an iced coffee in California. There for a minute, I thought he was a time lord, but I'm glad you corrected (laughs) that it was 2022. He could be a time lord. Who knows? He came off of a couch in Stevenage for crying out loud. Does anyone know what comes off of a couch in Stevenage? I don't know. 
Is it in Kent? You know, I'd, I'd actually read this story. Where where in California was he? I, it didn't I mean, even really say. I don't even know. And it had pictures California of him a... and some dudes, and it didn't even say who the dudes were he was with. I don't know. I do remember mm. I posted this from the beginning of the pandemic when Idris Elba got uh, COVID, and they show a picture because he got it at some event, and it's like, Idris Elba, his wife, Lewis Hamilton. Nobody mentions that Lewis Hamilton is right next to him. And I'm like, yeah. Lewis, he has COVID. Like, <laughs> like nobody knows who he is over he here. Knew. It's fine. All right. Also up um, in the headlines is Lewis Hamilton warned Max Verstappen's new Red Bull car already as good as title winner. Oh, I read that as like he was talking to the car, like, listen here, buddy. <laughs> Lewis Hamilton spotted. No, Lewis Hamilton warned Max Verstappen's Max new, Red Bull, his new Red Bull car. Like, hey, number 33, you <laughs> just watch it. I Don't you, you do it. Yes, I find, I find that a very confusing headline. When I, it is. I like the way I read it, but clearly. I like the way you read it, too. But it's actually saying, Lewis Hamilton warned Max Verstappen's new Red Bull car already as good as the title winner. Now, right. I took the liberty of going ahead and reading that story for all of you out there. No one warned anyone of anything in there. It just says that there were some initial reports, didn't even quote who those reports were, suggesting that the car is as, the 22 car is as fast as the 21 car on the simulator. Congratulations. Really? How is that a story? What? Oh. Okay. You know, I, I wonder, too, if, like, because uh, a lot of the, the drivers, like, talk to the car. Like, Valentino Rossi w is really well known for, like, talking to his bike, and he places his stickers on meticulously. Like, he has a real relationship with his bike. Maybe that's why I think maybe Lewis Hamilton is just, like, talking right to the Red Bull. Like, listen here, you piece of trash. I'm, I'm, well, I've had enough of you. It's like, it's like Robert Duvall talking to Cole Trickle's car, you know? Isn't it? <laughs> Oh, way to bring that NASCAR way back around. Huh? Hell Nicely yeah. Done. Pretty Nicely impressed, done. huh? I know. Okay. There Next up, um, I don't care if he comes back. Lewis Hamilton urged to retire and give younger driver a chance by Williams Chief. Whoa! Ah! That was Yos Capito who said, I don't care if he comes back. Matter of fact, he ought to retire and give some of the younger drivers that seat and give them a chance now. He's achieved enough in the sport. Good riddance. See ya. Um. Uh, oh. Uh, all right. Okay. This is gonna be. This is gonna be like when uh, Lewis Hamilton no, didn't know who Fred Vassar is. I, I don't think he knows who you are either. So. <laughs> this right is on. like Yost who? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah oh. Sure. Okay. Yeah. Williams. I've heard of them. So that was. Uh, uh, them's as harsh words, Yost. Harsh I don't words. Don't care if he comes back. I don't Sprint care if he races, comes back. I haven't made a decision on those yet, but Lewis Hamilton. Right. Don't, don't I don't care. care if he comes back. Don't care. Okay. I don't know. The longer this drags on, the less I find myself concerned about it, to be honest. I, I no. don't I'm, I'm kind of like, if he comes back, gonna... great. If he comes back, great. It'd be great to see him back in the sport and going yeah. for the championship. If he doesn't, I, this sport goes on. I, you know, whatever. I've parted ways with multiple champions in the past and whatever. So, like Nico Rosberg, I know how hard that one was on you. That was a tough one. It was a tough one. That, yeah, that was a tough I one. I know. I know it was hard for you. <laughs> you know, Leek, Nico, he's all electric now. Boy! Right? So, he um, is all electric. He yeah, is everywhere, he is. too. But he's uh, everywhere. He just, I don't, yeah. I don't, what, that's like a non, I don't know. That The only way that's good is if it was like the 700 person that's asked him that. And, yeah, right. You know, he was just like, right. I don't care. Stop right. asking me questions about Lewis. Next one. Uh, Man United star Cristiano Ronaldo poses with controversial F1 star Nikita Mazepin during mystery winter break workout. Mystery winter break workout. <laughs> What's that? They make... They make it sound like Nikita is spiking people's coffee with uranium or something. Like he's, like he's about as popular as herpes. I is mean, he okay. well, I, I didn't know he was that controversial. I, I didn't mean... either. He was poses with controversial F one star in mystery winter break workout. 
I, I okay. Don't, I, I don't know. I didn't. First of all, I hope the picture included the, the, the Ronaldo statue because that thing is still an atrocity. I can't believe nobody's ever fixed that. Second of all, I didn't know that. I mean, I don't like Mazepin, but I didn't think he was controversial in the like he's not i was trying to think of i don't i can't think of a controversial driver off the top of my head but you know um uh, all right i just like and i love the phrase mystery winter break workout mystery winter break workout it's like some divorce court stuff right there right (laughs) yeah it is yeah i was calling him and calling him and he didn't answer and then i found out he was with that loser controversial f1 star Mazepin, and a mystery, and a mystery winter, winter break, break workout. workout. Yeah. I knew it. So I don't weird. trust that guy. That's why we're here. Such a weird headline. Um, hey, next that up, is a weird story. Isn't it weird? Next one is Bodas colon. I was wondering why Rosberg retired. Now I understand. That was amazing. <laughs> that whole story was amazing. That one. Oh I did my, read. that one was good. No shit. Like, yeah. Yeah. Got it. Uh, yeah. Next one is uh, Mercedes reportedly join Red Bull in failing crash test. Re- reportedly join like it's a club or a cause that they're both promoting. Right. Like I threw my car over the cliff. Oh, me too. Right. Right. Mercedes joins Red Bull in failing the test. Let's, yeah. Yes. Okay. It's a weird, weird way to say that. You could just say Mercedes and Red Bull also fail right. the test, but yeah, it's kind of weird. Reportedly joined Red Bull, and I don't know. I don't know. Maybe it's a British thing. I don't know. I I'm gonna. I think my favorite is still gonna be Lewis Hamilton warns Max Verstappen's new Red Bull. <laughs> <laughs> <It's>... <laughs> hey, you dunk. number thirty three, number one, um, and yeah, finally, is a... yeah, this is the last one I have. Valtteri Bottas, a loser, as Red Bull chief makes brutal assessment of ex Mercedes star. <laughs> what? Yikes! Oh, loser. Oh, oh, we'll do it live. Wow. Doctor Helmet Marco Marco Helmet. That guy. Getting edgy, man. He didn't he's... just fall out and say that he's a loser, but he was comparing him to Perez, and he was saying that as far as being a guy who comes back to the field and does a lot of prolific passing compared to Perez. He's a loser, you know, in that sense. But anyway, Uh, I, I'm going to, I think that was lost in translation to be honest with you, but anyway, Botas joins Perez in being a loser. Reportedly. Right. Botas reportedly joined Perez in being a loser. What does it all mean? Basil? I don't know. Anyway. All right. Let's do some mailbag, Grace, and get out of the podcast. You've got All right. mail. All right. Up is Brad Sunshine asked. Brad, I don't know if that's really your last name, but if it is, that's awesome. Um, it's better than my rally car name, which is Gremlin McGremlins. <laughs> nice. You all got to, if you, uh, on Twitter, we posted some, uh, me doing some Gran Turismo and then some rally driving with eight of my co-driving cats, which is a great mm-hmm. way. <laughs> to have to, I don't see Sebastian Loeb out there driving like that. I don't know. No. But no. Gremlin McGremlin is my rally car name. So I like it. I know. Uh, so Brad asks, he's got a great question. He says, okay. I have been an advocate for no tire warmers for a while. I remember okay. watching JPM and Cart mastering outlaps better than the competition on multiple occasions. With the lowering of tire warm, warmer temperatures, do you think it will negatively impact the undercut where they worked well previously? And I think it's a great question, Brad, because if you consider diving in for the undercut and coming out on really hot tires and you have a lot of grip instantly because the tires are so, so hot, what Brad's asking is if those tires aren't as hot and they're cooler with less grip, and you come out, will it sort of neuter the whole concept of undercutting uh, in, in an impactful way in Formula One? And I think that's a really good question. You know, yeah. would that happen? Well, yes, coming out on cooler tires means you wouldn't have the grip level that It'd you have slower. now. Mm-hmm. And so you wouldn't be able to take the corners quite with the bravado that you might. And therefore, you may have to get spend time getting those tires up to temperature and leave you in the clutches of the person you were trying to undercut. 
It's a great point. A lot of that probably depends on track position. The track position and lead you did or did not have, depending on if it was undercut or overcut, and depending or if if it was an undercut, depending on if you're the person trying to undercut or being undercut. It depends on what kind of lead is there, how many you know, how much gap is there. Uh, it does cycle, so when the other person stops, right. um, they'll be on those cooler tires too. Um, mm-hmm. There's a lot at probably at play, but I think it is a very timely question. And I am curious now, Brad, to watch these first races and see if there is an impact of that. But I think I think it's a great point. I liked yeah. it. Good question, Reportedly. Brad. Reportedly. It was a good question. Yeah. I Brad enjoyed sunshine. it. I like Brad. I like yeah, Brad. Seems He's like a, a nice guy. guy. Seems very like bright. a good guy. Yes. See? Unlike us, he's very insightful. We're only occasionally insightful on the podcast. Yeah, and I think that's that's something that we all kind of don't pay attention to either. So mm. it'll be interesting to see that kind of uh, detail, what that what an effect that has. I agree. All right. That does it for this podcast. If you like this podcast, go over to iTunes, give us some love, give us a good rating. If you really like this podcast, you could be like our awesome Patreon supporters. You could go over to our Patreon page and support us for as little as a dollar a month. And uh, we would be grateful if you did that because we would not and could not do this podcast without our Patreon supporters out there. And so, you know, I understand people come and people leave and we've had some folks leave. So if you're thinking about joining as a Patreon supporter, that would be awesome. Uh, We'd be indebted to you for sure. And uh, also, we'd love to hear what you think about any one of these uh, stories or your own stories. Appreciate you from last week telling us what your Mount Rushmore of F1 looked like. I enjoyed reading some of those. So thanks for sharing that. But you can leave your opinions in the comment section of this podcast post at our website, theparkformay.com. Just do it with decorum and civility, no personal attacks. And until next week, when we come back to do this all over again, this is Todd, a.k.a. Negative Camber, saying so long, Grace. See you next week. That's it, man. Game over, man. It's game over.